And at the same time, however, that these people are becoming so liberal, they also uh, now no longer even believe in the divinity of Christ. They doubt that he was anything more than a historical figure who happened to just be in the right place at the right time and a cult following uh, grew up around him. But I want to tell you something. That's not the kind of faith that's going to get you through if this kind of stuff really starts happening. Uh, the rapture could happen, the Lord could take us all away, but we could see some stuff coming down on this earth, and I want to have great faith, don't you? And I want to tell you something, they're wrong about Jesus, because from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, it gives us the concept, I'm going to give it to you very quickly and then I'm going to quit. In Genesis, he is the prophesied one who will be the fulfillment of the proto-evangelium, the divine seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head and redeem mankind to God. That's where the revelation begins. Oh, you know he's our champion, don't you? Uh, you know uh, partly why I can have such great confidence, because I don't intend on slugging it out with the giants all by my little pretty self. <laughs> In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest making intercession for men in the Holy of Holies. In Numbers, he is the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that guides the covenant people. In Deuteronomy, he is a prophet like unto Moses that will arrive in the fullness of time. In Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, he is the captain of our salvation, the judge and the lawgiver and the blessed kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is the coming Messiah, exalted by God with power. In First and Second Kings, he is the king who will reign with ultimate power. In First and Second Chronicles, he is from the tribe of Judah, typified by the temple with wisdom greater than that of Solomon. In Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, he is the day spring from on high and the Lord our shepherd, whose kingdom shall be from everlasting to everlasting. In the Song of Solomon, he is the bridegroom whose marriage to the bride is faithful and forthcoming. In Isaiah, he is God with us. The sevenfold spirit of God is upon him. He heals the blind, makes the lame walk, unplugs the ears of the deaf. He becomes a light to the Gentiles who dies as a guilt offering for sin, but who rises from the dead to live forever. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he becomes the righteous branch. In Ezekiel and Daniel, he is the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. In Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. He is the pierced son and the burden bearer, a mighty savior and a cleansing fountain who becomes a priest and a king. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the New Testament arrives, and here he is. A babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah, born of a virgin. In Mark, he's a miracle worker. In Luke, he's the perfect physician. In John, he is the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God, the bread of life, the light of the world, and the door to the sheepfold. In Acts, he is the ascended Lord and the judge of the living and the dead. In Romans, he is the root of Jesse that becomes a rock cut out without hands, that becomes an offense to many, but that becomes a deliverer to others. In First in 2 Corinthians, he is the first fruits of the church. In Galatians, he sets us free. In Ephesians, he is the head over all things and the cornerstone of the church. In Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, and Timothy, he is the image of the invisible God who meets our every need, the mediator between God and man, and the soon coming king. In Titus and Philemon, he is the blessed hope and a friend who is closer than the brother. Somebody say amen. In Hebrews and James, he is the author and the finisher of our faith, the key to patience and wisdom, and the blood that washes away our sins. In First and Second Peter, he is a living stone and a chief shepherd who watches over the church. In First and Second John and Third John, he is everlasting love and eternal life for those that know him. While in Jude, he is the only wise God and our one and only Savior. And now let hell hear this, because in Revelation he arrives, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the manifested Word of Almighty God the bright and morning star, the lion of the tribe of Judah that hath prevailed, the king of kings and lord of lords, who, ladies and gentlemen, whose appearance is going to shatter the schemes of occultic spirits and evil men with the brightness of a thousand suns, and at whose coming every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How, 
How can I have confidence for the future? How can I not have confidence for the future? The bottom line, the occult have a plan. God has a better one. I hope you know whose side you are on. And there's uh, the last and final part. Thank you uh, for putting up with me.